as folks trickle in, um, I'm Polly, I'm the founder of Black Women Photographers, and I see some regular faces, well, names in the chat, I should say. So if you've been here before, if this is your first time, please drop your name in the chat and your location. We love to know where people are tuning in from. Um, and if this is your first time attending the session as well, let us know. But if you've been coming to all of the sessions, please also let us know. Um, and we will get started in just a second. I see we have Minneapolis, Brooklyn, yes, Swazi in London has been coming every week. Tony, awesome. this is your first session. Welcome. Um, as folks who have been here before know that all of the sessions are being recorded. You can replay them at any time on our respective websites. We'll drop the links in the chat. Um, so cool to see some new faces as well. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, Turkey, Oakland, Atlanta, second session, first session in Brooklyn, welcome. Amazing, a lot of first timers. Well, folks who are new, you have some homework to do. <laughs> you got to replay the sessions from the last few weeks. Um, that will be your homework for this weekend before the last session next week. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Um, but should, should we do the housekeeping? Oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. hi, my name is uh, Washera. I'm uh, the Ready Africa coordinator. And, uh, yeah, uh, I'm happy to be hosting uh, this class of the essentials with Polly. And we're happy to have all of you here today uh, with us. Yeah. And as mentioned, I'm Polly. I'm the founder of Black Women Photographers. I'm also excited to co-partner with uh, the Everyday Projects and the wonderful team. Um, <laughs> yes, I see Kenya. Oh um, my goodness, I, I love it. I love it. I'm a little biased, but we have uh, some great folks uh, that you'll hear from in just a second. And we'll do some housekeeping. So um, as mentioned, we are Black Women Photographers and Everyday Projects. Um, you should know where to follow us. If you don't, you can see there. And as I mentioned, all of these sessions are being recorded. We've had a few different sessions so far. The Ghazi and Nigerian photojournalist kicked it off for season two um, at the beginning of this month. And then after that, we had two safety um, and digital security trainings that were super vital. Um, just everyday information that people probably don't know about when it comes to digital, digital safety. Um, and now we have two guests with us that you can go ahead and follow them if you're not already on Twitter, Instagram, all the things, and that's their handles right there. So yeah, uh, the essentials are free photography classes and uh, we work uh, together with the Everyday Projects, Black Women Photographers are, are the main uh, partners of uh, these classes. And we'd love it if you made a $5 donation to the Black, uh, to black Women Photographers and uh, that will help them continue doing their amazing work. And uh, feel free to donate either on Venmo, Cash App, and follow them on their socials uh, so that you can see the many cool opportunities that they have. Yeah. Um, and with that said, I'm also excited to announce that the grant applications for a Black Women Photographers First Ever Grant Fund are open. Um, the deadline is quickly approaching next week. Next Thursday is the deadline. Um, there's 50K in project funding and in gear, um, two camera giveaways, and the biggest grant is 10K, second grant is 5K, and then the other grants are 3K. So do not miss out. I'll drop that link in the chat as well. Um, and yes, you can apply for all of the grants 
um, but of course you'll only be selected for one. Um, and there's other information. Oh, perfect. My friends already did it. Thank you, Everyday Projects. You can see all the information there. And on Thursday, um, which is tomorrow, uh, we'll have a Twitter Q&A uh, about the grant fund. Then you can ask questions, get advice, all the things. So you can join us on Twitter for that tomorrow. And also, we, uh, the Everyday Projects, we have a podcast that uh, is special, especially uh, for everyone who is interested in visual storytelling and visual journalism. Uh, the, the episode that we just dropped today is very special as it is connected to what we, where we are on right now, the internet and uh, its various social media platforms and how, when, one can be given a an username and a little courage, the opportunity to publicly speak their minds, so much can happen. So we'll be talking about uh, call out culture, canceling and uh, flat out cyber bullying. And uh, our host, Tazneem Al-Sultan, she will be sharing how uh, the different, uh, different phenomenon of cancel culture and uh, cyberbullying looks like in the visual journalism space. So uh, check out uh, the Repicture podcast on in, anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we got through most of the housekeeping as mentioned, because there's a lot of first timers here in the chat. Please go to our respective websites and replay the previous conversations. And also RSVP for the next class, the final class on November 3rd uh, with two incredible photo editors for everything you need to know about working with photo editors, even the art of captioning, because there's more two captions than a one-liner from Drake and all those things. So please do register for that. Um, and I think that's everything. I think we got through all of the housekeeping. Um, and so, because we have two incredible guests, um, why don't we turn it to them, Mashera? Uh, just uh, before our, our guests join us, uh, this, this season of The Essentials is, uh, has been made possible because of our partners, uh, Africa No Filter, Pulitzer Center, Photo Wings, Ecos Alliance, uh, and um, thanks to all our regular partners uh, of the Everyday Project, uh, the Open Society, Foundations, Culture and Arts, and Code for Africa. And these classes are free, so feel free to share them along with your friends and mentees and communities. Yes, 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 super important. Um, and both of the folks here today are actual grantees from the Pulitzer Center. So do check out those opportunities and they will be dropped in the chat as well. So uh, without further ado, we introduce our teachers for the day. Uh, they'll all introduce themselves and their work. So today we'll start with Sarah Iswa, uh, the, the, the city judge. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, super glad to be here with you all. Um, my name is uh, Sarah Iswa. I am a photographer. I like to say photographer because I've done a lot of things in my career and I still continue to do so. Um, but I have a preference for a portrait and a documentary photographer. Um, so I'll just kind of um, run you back to the kind of where I started from so you can uh, see my journey. But I think, um, you know, this, this class is, you know, talking about how do you start? Um, and I think the first thing I'll say is uh, just start, you know, create the work. Um, so as for my background, um, I um, did not study photography and self-taught. I uh, studied sociology and psychology um, in the States. And then I moved back home um, to Kenya, uh, where I live. And um, I guess um, early on, um, um, I, I was always artistically inclined, but um, being from the home that I was in, you know, I was the first to graduate from college. And so that was kind of suppressed. Um, 
Yeah, so then um, I, I moved back home and I uh, got, a, got a corporate uh, job and working on the, uh, the coast of Kenya. And it was a place, it was a very special place for me uh, because it was a place that I had spent a lot of my childhood. Um, and so, um, you know, I had a camera with me and kind of just began uh, to photograph, um, um, kind of to, as a way to express myself, but also as a way to reconnect and also as a way to kind of deal with some of the feelings that I, um, I had about being back. So, um, you know, that's what I did. And I think at the beginning of my career, um, um, you know, Tumblr, Tumblr was, was like really popular. And I remember looking on Tumblr and, and thinking about how, uh, you know, you know, just looking at the different types of photography and thinking about how, how great it was um, that people were able to express themselves in this way, um, the type of storytelling and all that. And so, you know, I, I quickly kind of became much more interested and even eventually started sharing my own stories. So um, fast forward a little bit, um, and I was still working a corporate job. I was very bored. Um, I wasn't thinking about photography as, as a career at that point, but, um, you know, someone, um, someone uh, reached out to me on my DMs and Tumblr. I don't think they were called DMs at that time, but she said, hey, I love your photography. Uh, will you shoot my wedding? Um, and she, she was actually uh, living in the States, but, um, but was from, from, from Mombasa where I was working. And she said that she loved how I captured uh, the Swahili culture and, and wanted me to shoot her wedding. So of course I was freaking out. Nobody had ever really, I hadn't even taken myself seriously, let alone, uh, you know, worked, had a photography gig. I was just kind of shooting things that, you know, reminded me of, of my childhood. And, um, and so I, I, I freaked out, but um, I, I, I kind of like found the courage and, um, and, you know, I took the gig. At that point I hadn't even, you know, I hadn't even learned how to use flash. So uh, one of my friends kind of came over uh, one of the nights before and, you know, we did like a crash course in, 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 you know, in, in flash photography. Um, and I ended up shooting the wedding. It was a three day long Swahili wedding. Um, and I did great. So um, I think um, I think that was kind of the starting point for me um, in terms of um, you know the fact that someone actually believed in in the in the in the photography that I was doing enough to want me to shoot you know such a special day in their life. But also for me, kind of that you know made me think about like well you know maybe this is something that I could do. Um, so I think that's where it started for me. After that, you know, I just kind of kept kept working on the photography. I moved to um, to Nairobi, um, and there was a much larger kind of community here. And um, Instagram it, that was a time when Instagram was getting popular, and so I started posting work on Instagram um, and joined kind of the um, the uh, the Nairobi Instagram community. And, I think you know, even as um, even as you know, someone who is looking into getting into photography, I think that's um, that's a huge thing is um, this idea of, of of you know finding and building community, because out of that um, you know we would you know kind of challenge each other, uh, photo you know go on trips together. I ended up shooting all types of things, cityscapes, landscapes just because I was able to, to go out with this community of photographers and we were kind of all learning. Um, I have to say, I'm, um, you know, this portion of my class is based on, um, you know, my journey uh, being a self-taught photographer and living in a place where um, there are really aren't any institutions um, that, that teach photography. And so um, a lot of it has kind of been trial and error and, um, and, and, and having, having a community um, in that way was, was extremely helpful um, in, helping, in helping to kind of to build, um, to build my portfolio and my work and also to kind of direct me in terms of the, you know, in terms of what, my, what I was actually interested in. Um, uh, so I think uh, part of, you know, an, another part of like, what, what, what do you do once you've created the work? Um, I think it's important to share the work, right? So um, I've already talked about how I started posting on, um, on Tumblr um, and then kind of migrated to Instagram. Um, and, you know, then I started getting um, all types of, um, you know, kind of clients, 
um, Instagram featured featured my work, and I, you know, I ended up getting quite a number of followers, which then helped me to get more work. Um, and then, um, and then someone said, "Hey, um, there's a, this Uganda Press Photography Awards, and um, um, I think you should enter your work." And at that time, I was like, I mean, of course, I, I was I was still shooting, and I was still working a corporate position, position, but I. Um, um, you know, I, I had created this quite a quite a quite a large uh, body of work. Not really um, full stories, but kind of you know, kind of snapshots, as I called it. And um, I ended up submitting my work into the Uganda Press Photo Awards, uh, even though I, I really didn't. I, at that time, I didn't really know if it was good enough. Uh, and so then I ended up winning um, um, in two of the categories that I submitted in, and then came runner up in um, two other categories. And so, um, um, I mean, of course the win was amazing, but I think that for me, uh, what was even more amazing was that Ida, Ida Malune, who was on the, um, on the jury of the awards had seen my work and then she reached out to me for something else. So I can't stress enough, um, of how important it is to also kind of um, uh, uh, share your work or even enter into different types of opportunities. Um, because as I was kind of doing these things, um, you know, at the time really didn't have anybody kind of telling me to do them, but just kind of, you know, people asking me or uh, recommending me for things. Um, it kind of led into this one thing uh, leading it to another. So um, Ida then, you know, says, hey, um, I want to kind of submit some of your work for this nomination that I have. And it was for the uh, Discovery Award um, in Arles, in France, which is kind of one of the, the largest, one of the largest photography festivals in the world. And um, at the time, I had just worked on a project. Um, I think I'll start kind of sharing my screen now. Um, I had just worked on a project. Okay. Um, I think it's showing on your screen. Um, and it was called uh, Stranger in a Familiar Land. Um, it was a collaborative project uh, with uh, Florence, uh, who is pictured in the, in the work, and also a collaboration with uh, Jojo Abbott, who uh, was doing a residency, uh, was, was doing a residency here. Um, and basically, I had just read about um, the atrocities that were happening to uh, people with albinism um, in parts of sub-Saharan Africa and um, how, you know, people were kind of hunting them for body parts. And, you know, um, I had never read that before and so was interested more and kind of contacted the Albinism Society of Kenya and then, um, and then kind of created this work. Uh, when I created the work, I had no idea, you know, it, the intention was never to enter it into anything or to, you know, um, you know, I, I didn't know, I didn't really create it with the intention of, of doing anything, but I, I did share the work and, um, and, and, and this work kind of ended up um, winning the Discovery Award at Arl. Um, I think um, things really, really changed for me after this. Um, you know, um, I got contacted by a lot of um, NGOs who were interested in, um, you know, in me kind of doing work for them and um, particularly as it related to social issues in a kind of creative way. Um, I um, was getting, uh, I would get also like fashion work. Um, so basically that kind of opened the door uh, for something else. So I would say kind of going back to what I was talking about before, that um, it's really important that even as it is to create the work, it's also just as important to share the work um, in terms of kind of progressing with your career. Um, after that, um, I, um, so I work on a lot of uh, personal projects as well. So in as much as um, I have, um, you know, done work kind of uh, for different publications, for different um, NGOs, um, a lot of a lot of um, the work that has kind of given me the most visibility has been personal projects, and I think that's because um, it's the work that I'm most passionate about. Um, it's the work that I, you know, it's the stories that I come across, um, 
that um, really speak to me. So this was another personal project that I worked on. Um, oh, and just to run this back, this work was acquired by the National Gal Gallery of Victoria. It's in collection there. It's been kind of exhibited at uh, several festivals and, you know, this coming from a, you know, from something that I, I really, you know, when I was creating the work, didn't know where it would ever end, end up if anywhere. Um, so this, this project um, I, is, was also a personal project. Um, and it's basically about um, um, ballet in, um, in Kibera, which is one of the largest kind of informal settlements. Um, I, you know, I, I, I heard that ballet was being taught there and that, you know, um, and, and I was really curious about what it was doing kind of in terms of, um, you know, helping to build these, um, these young people's identity and um, what it was, you know, how it made them feel, particularly because ballet isn't really seen as, um, you know, is, is, a, is seen as quite a prestigious or expensive kind of um, activity. And so I wanted to see what that would look like and, and how, you know, how the girls were kind of relating to it. And so, um, again, this was a personal project. Um, um, and and ha this project has been exhibited in, um, in, in Italy and, and, you know, just all over the world. Um, and um, it's just something that really just kind of started as a, as a personal project. Um, so um, just to keep to keep going, um, around this time, um, I was also contacted by Canon and um, joined the ambassador program. Um, and, um, um, and, you know, as I continue to do more work, so in, in, in as much as I do my personal projects, I often get um, commissions as well. So um, this uh, part of this, the work that I'm showing you was um, some work that I did for Vox um, through a, a Pulitzer grant, um, um, which I was very grateful for, but I had the opportunity to, um, to travel to, uh, to the Congo and do a project about, um, about this tree and um, how the local scientists were um, were kind of um, um, trying to preserve the tree because it was it was um, being cut down, and I mean it, I think in some um, places was was becoming um, extinct, and so it was super interesting to me because um, these were local scientists um, using uh, science from you know using also like colonial colonial kind of data to to do the work, um, but also. Um, was very um, interesting in terms of like um, looking at climate change and and also kind of our contribution to that, um, but also the you know the connection between um, between the people on the ground and and, and nature. Um, yeah, so this commission, you know, um, um, and and a lot of the other work that I've done um, for publications, really, um, you know, it kind of happened with me, you know, posting or sharing the work. Um, um, either on my website or my social media. Um, a lot of times um, when I have um, work for publications, I might not share everything that I work on, but um, on my website, I do have a section um, that has just tear sheets on it so that if people want to see, you know, work that I've done um, for different publications that they um, can find it there. Um, So that was some work that I did um, 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 for a publication. Um, and then again, now to personal work, um, you know, I did this project also in the Congo. Um, um, I was part of a festival and um, uh, the Lubumbashi Festival with the other project and I met um, I met the director of Picha, which is a residency in um, in Lubumbashi in the Congo, and um, you know he said, "Hey, why don't you come and do a residency here?" Um, and I was invited to do that, and so I created this work um, based on um, the Kimbanguists, who are a um, a religious group uh, based in the Congo, uh, in Lubumbashi, and uh, basically. They, um, you know, they were kind of founded or came to being um, during the colonial regime, and um, they're really pretty much were um, kind of using their spirituality um, to resist the colonial regime. 
And I think one of the biggest things for me was, um, um, and why I was interested in this work was, you know, they believed that Jesus was black. And so for me, um, I was super interested in how they were uh, using using spirituality and appropriating Christianity to kind of, and how that worked um, in terms of their identity. So, um, I did this work. A lot of people reference this work, particularly editors. They'll say, um, you know, we like how you photograph this and we want you to take the same approach. So this, this work is uh, posted on my um, website, um, but a lot of people will, will refer to this um, when they kind of um, engage me for assignments. Um, and that's why I think it's so important to, to really work, um, to, to continue with personal work. I think pretty much um, everything apart from the, um, um, the work that I did for Fox that I've shown uh, before um, is, is personal work. Um, I'm, I realize that I'm probably um, running out of time. I can't see anybody was share. I need a nod or something. Um, and um, yeah, um, just to just to show kind of the things that I have um, I have worked on. I've also gotten fashion work. Um, but if you'll notice a lot of a lot of my work, even though it cr crosses through different genres, um, you know, kind of still takes a documentary approach. This work was um, inspired by Malik Sidibe, um, and it was a commission um, from Dior, um, and they basically commissioned seven um, African women photographers um, to uh, take their collection and to create uh, four images from it. And so uh, this is where this work came from. Um, and um, you know, I, I mean, I think the aesthetic really is, is just the same, but it was kind of just applying that to, to this work. Um, so basically like one, one I think for me, um, and this maybe might be the, the second last um, uh, series that I show you guys, but um, this again is, was a personal project, uh, which I did where I photographed young Kenyans uh, who were kind of like expressing themselves through fashion and looking at um, identity and, and, and how an agency, and, and I really wanted to show young Kenyans how they wanted to be seen. This work was seen by the Bristol Archives um, and you know, they asked me to create some work for the Bristol Photo Festival, but you know, juxtaposing these images to um, um, some of their arch archival images. Um, so I essentially how that happened is I um, um, looked at some of their archival images and um, was really kind of drawn to the fact that um, a, a lot of a lot of colonial imagery um, really isn't about the people in the images. Um, um, and and for me, and, and that was clear kind of in the captions that went along with these images. And so I use a silhouetting technique on the um, on the images, just so that I could show, or in a, in a way, kind of challenge the colonial gaze, um, um, because that's kind of what the you know what what that meant to me. And so the work was then um, um, exhibited uh, alongside this at the Bristol Photo Festival this year. Um, um, just to show kind of what the opposites in terms of agency look like. Um, you know, here's, you know, um, young Kenyans kind of showing themselves how they wanted to be seen. And here's kind of colonial photography, which, you know, had kind of little to no regard um, in terms of, um, of, of, the, of the people who um, were um, in, the, in the images. So I'll just kind of move ahead a little bit. Um, I might skip some of that work. Um, this is, um, was Sharon, am I good on time? How much? Uh, yeah, okay. two more minutes is fine. Two more minutes? Uh, we can do with five. Okay, let's okay. do. Okay, yeah, I'll... <laughs> okay, sorry about that. So um, I just kind of want to end, um, this is another personal project um, that I've, I've been working on. Um, um, I, um, I've been working with with Luke, who is 16 years old now, an autistic boy. Um, it's it's a long term project that I, I've been working on. Um, I, um, I I you know I've been photographing him and since he was 10, um, but essentially um, you know his um, you know there are no really he ha he hasn't had any resources in terms of um, um, you know his disability and so you know 
um, just kind of trying to photograph those challenges. And also in terms of, um, you know, um, him not being able to kind of develop um, because of that. And, and also kind of challenges in his, in his family and, and his mom also um, being terminally ill. So um, this is a project that I, I've worked on for the past five years and it is still ongoing, but also a personal project. Um, so I think, um, I think I'll just kind of summarize, like for me, um, you know, if someone said like, how do I get started in photography? The first thing I would say is create the work, um, you know, just start. Um, I think the beautiful thing about social media is that it removed the gatekeepers. You know, um, you can now publish work on your website. You can publish your work on social media, and you know nobody really has to approve that. But the good thing is that um, is that people can see your work, and then they can reach out to you directly. Um, and you really don't need um, anybody's you know permission to create. Um, the next thing is share the work. You know, I think it's it's often frightening um, because we all get imposter syndrome and think about, you know, is the work good enough? Um, and you know, I think I think if you don't share the work, then you know, then you know, you you I guess you'll never really know. Um, I think because I was able to to you know whether it was entering a, a competition or whether it was um, um, you know applying for a grant, I think. Uh, because I was able to, to, to get into those spaces and people could see my work. And even if I didn't win in at times that uh, someone, someone still saw the work and recommended me for something else. So I think it's super important to share the work um, and um, to, to kind of put yourself out there. Um, I think one of the, the most important thing is, is also build networks. I think that it's also because of social media, it's so much easier now to, um, to build networks. Um, you have amazing communities now, black, you know, black women photographers, African women photography, everyday projects. There's so many communities now that you can be a part of. Um, and through those communi communities, there are educational resources, um, you, you know, learn about stuff, workshops, and all those are just kind of ways that you can um, that you can essentially, um, that you can meet people. And I think that's the key thing is, is having the opportunity to meet people. Um, even portfolio reviews, you know, there's so many um, free, you know, portfolio reviews that, you know, that you can take advantage of. A lot of times editors are part of those reviews um, and people will, rem will remember your work. It, it's, it's intimidating, I think, to, to show your work, but, um, you know, you never know who the right person is. Um, and, you know, and I think anybody can discover your work from anywhere. So, you know, whether it's applying for a grant or a festival, um, whatever, I think it's really important to, um, to, 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 to build, build your networks. And um, I think social media does, makes that easy for you. Um, I know that I've shared quite a bit of work, different kinds of work. I have some of it posted on my um, my website and some of it isn't. You know, I use Instagram more just to, to kind of show my range, but I have different portfolios ready um, at any time. So if an NGO says, hey, um, you know, I think I'm lucky enough that I'm at the point in my career that when people reach out to me for certain things, I think that they already know my work. But I think that even if you're starting out early on and kind of building your portfolio, that if there's an opportunity, for example, for, um, you know, NGO work, that you have a separate portfolio for that. You know, if you have um, different other different kinds of work, that you have a, a separate portfolio for that, because I think it's really super important um, to be just have that work ready um, to share, um, you know, um, um, with the right people. So um, yeah, I, I, I hope that that was helpful. I know I've kind of shown a lot of work and maybe talked a lot, but um, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. I'm looking forward to seeing some of Sarah Beth's, um, Sarah Beth's work as well. Oh my goodness, where to even begin? <laughs> this is so amazing. And there's a lot of praise for you in the chat. Um, so thank you all for your kind comments and keep the questions coming. I already see some folks posting on social about this talk. Feel free to share gems on social as well and tag Sarah. Um, <laughs> as you can see, the praise continues. Um, and it's also just super helpful to know that Sarah, you didn't start just by like, 
you know, you didn't start shooting Dior projects, right? You didn't start that way. So this was very insightful and thank you for your transparency and honesty. Um, we'll go and move forward with Sarah Beth's presentation and then we will do all the great questions towards the end. So stay tuned, y'all. Thank you so much, Sarah. Everybody, thank you so much for having me and thank you, Sarah, for presenting. That was really incredible to see your work. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with all of you. Awesome. So my name is Sarah Beth Maney. I'm a photojournalist, um, photography fellow with the New York Times based at their Washington DC Bureau covering politics. Um, I'm originally from the California Bay Area and my work focuses on issues related to housing inequality, education, disability, and issues that um, impact black and brown communities. I graduated from San Francisco State University in 2019 with a degree in photojournalism. And during that time, I held internships at the San Francisco Examiner, the Flint Journal in Michigan, and the SF Chronicle. So I wanna talk a little bit about my journey through journalism and all the different steps that I took because each path is so different. Um, so I had my first internship my sophomore year in college with the San Francisco Examiner. And I actually found out about this internship because of a tweet that I saw on Twitter. Um, the photo editor was looking to hire a summer intern and I emailed her right away and we set up a meeting and I was hired um, the next week to start as an intern. So this experience really prepared me um, for what it was like to work in a newsroom, but also gave me that experience covering breaking news assignments. Uh, the first week of my internship, one of my first assignments was to cover a triple homicide in San Francisco. And it was very difficult um, being new to journalism and having such a heavy assignment. But I think that's also um, one of the perks of starting at a smaller uh, local paper is that you are essentially the main photographer and you get to be really uh, involved in the community and document the big things that are happening. And after that internship ended, the photo editor who hired me sort of threw my name in the hat and uh, sent a recommendation over to the Chronicle um, and recommended that I freelance for them. So that was how I basically started getting freelance work was just by someone who um, knew my work, who knew that I would do a good job. And so I started getting frequent assignments from the Chronicle. This photo on the left was one of my first assignments that I ever had uh, for the Chronicle. And so I freelanced for a couple of years while I was in college. And that was one of the biggest challenges I think was balancing freelance work while also working part-time and being a full-time student. I was commuting two and a half hours every day to get to school. So it was a lot to manage and juggle, um, but I think it really taught me that being a journalist takes a lot of dedication. Um, I missed a lot of family gatherings and birthday parties and things like that, but I think everything really paid off in the end. After a few months of doing freelance work and taking on assignments, I realized that it was important to find my voice. I think that's one of the most crucial things as a photographer is to find those subjects and those stories that you really care about and that relate to you directly. Um, so I, this was hard for me. I took um, time off of school and I sort of needed to recalibrate myself and reset. And during that time, I tried to think about things that I care about that are happening in my community. And one of those things was the death of Mia Wilson, who was an 18 year old girl that was murdered on a BART train in Oakland. And the thing that was really um, personal for me was that the route that Nia traveled on that day was the same route that I would take every single day um, to get to school. And so I started attending vigils and that's how I met different women who were willing to stand in front of the camera and um, let me interview them. And so that was how I got involved um, 
with with this project and started finding subjects for the story. So I think a lot of the times it really takes putting yourself out there and going to those events and those spaces where you um, want to meet people. I think this project also helped me um, gain clarity and confidence in myself and my work since this was one of the first personal projects that I did. Um, it sort of showed me that I can do this, I can start something. And I think the first step is always the hardest. Um, so I just wanna plant that seed of encouragement to everybody that the first step is always the hardest, but once you start finding those people and making connections, everything always uh, ends up sort of falling into place. At the same time, I knew I was really interested in covering politics. Um, I'm a first generation college student, so politics and things happening in the world were not uh, things that I was really exposed to as a kid. And so when I started college, I was really interested in taking political science classes and just learning about the ways that different laws um, impact uh, marginalized communities. And I really admired work of White House photographers. And I knew that eventually DC was a place that I would want to end up. And so I basically approached that by looking for local events or campaigns that were happening in the area that I could pitch to editors at different newspapers. And so this was the Democratic uh, National Convention in San Francisco. And I asked one of the political editors at the Times if I could photograph this. And at the time I had only done one assignment for them. So the editor really took a chance on me and he was like, yeah, go ahead, photograph the whole weekend. Let me know how it goes. And so I made sure that after I photographed it, I reached out to him and asked for any feedback or advice he had for me. I think that's one of the things that's always been really helpful for me is asking for feedback. And I think it shows editors that you really care about the work that you're producing for them and you want to do a good job. And even now I still have um, this advice that people have told me in the back of my head every time I'm on an assignment or making photos, I'm thinking about the feedback um, that people have told me in the past. After I graduated college, I decided I wanted to do a couple more internships and get some experience under my belt of what it feels like to work in a newsroom. And so I chose to do an internship at the Flint Journal. Um, the application process was pretty informal. There wasn't really an application process. It was basically just me um, emailing and calling the photo editor uh, without trying to be too annoying, but explaining to him that I'm really uh, interested in working in this community. And specifically because it was important for me to work in a predominantly black community and get the experience of what it feels like to be in a smaller, tight-knit community um, and just really immerse myself um, in this area. And so these are some of the photos I made during that internship. And another thing was that I was covering a lot of sports, which is something completely out of my realm. I'm definitely not a sports person. I don't think I'm the greatest at shooting sports. And I knew that this internship would require a lot of that. And so that was why I chose that this internship as well was to challenge myself and do something outside of my comfort zone. Um, another thing about choosing internships, I think it's really important to um, be comfortable going to a different state or getting experience in a different area because that's showing editors that you're comfortable being sent on assignment um, to different places. At the time, there was also really um, great moments that happened that I had no idea were preparing me for my time in DC now. Um, I got to know, you know, the mayor and the governor and photograph them regularly. And now when I'm on a travel assignment with Biden and he lands in Michigan, I'm able to know who the mayor and the governor is. And so that really helped me um, as well as the campaign season was happening while I was in Flint. And so different candidates were visiting the city. And even if I wasn't on assignment or if it wasn't my assignment for the day, I would ask if I could go cover it just to have that to add to my portfolio, but also 
just to know what it's like working in that environment and photographing politics. So right when I um, left my internship and got back to the Bay Area was the same day that um, George Floyd was murdered. And so I immediately started attending the protests. I wasn't working for anyone or even freelancing. I was just out there to make images because I knew my perspective would be really important as a black woman. And um, in the Bay Area, I only know of three other black women photographers. And so I thought it was very necessary for me to be there. And one person I came across was Louis Michael wearing his cap and gown. Um, I took this photo of Louis and um, afterwards it went viral and it got a lot of attention and I felt like I was on cloud nine with everyone that was seeing this photo of Lewis because his statement was so powerful. Um, and I started receiving a lot of requests about licensing the image and something that really helped me out was that I had taken a business of photography class. Um, it's called Todd Bigelow's business of photography, which I would highly recommend taking um, because this photo was definitely used uh, without my permission. I had to file different lawsuits and get a lawyer and I had to draft a lot of contracts and negotiate rates. And so taking Todd Bigelow's business of photography class really prepared me um, how to deal with these situations. Um, but the response to this photo was really incredible. This was actually Lewis's first time ever attending a protest. And after this photo sort of circulated on the internet, people started reaching out to him, asking him to attend their protest and plan his own protests. And he ended up um, starting a nonprofit organization in Vallejo where he's from, and he ran for city council in Vallejo. So this photo not only influenced uh, my career and my path, but it also really influenced um, Lewis's career, which I thought was a really, really cool thing to be a part of. These are some more images from that same night. Um, I was not on an assignment, so I was really able to be creative and take my time and look for images that really made me feel something. I think one image that really stands out to me is the photo in the bottom middle of the three men standing on top of the rooftop with the clouds behind them. Um, this isn't really a traditional photo you see at a protest because it feels very calm and, and peaceful. And that was what I really liked about, about that photo. So my piece of advice would, um, would be to go places and photograph things that you wanna be hired for. Um, have those things in your portfolio and on your website and really show people what you care about. While I was covering the protest, I was also able to meet really incredible people that I ended up following um, over a series of um, seven or eight months. Um, this is Sophia Tupiola and her partner Dante. I met them during a Black Lives Matter protest when Sophia was eight months pregnant. Um, and I started documenting her pregnancy during my internship with the San Francisco Chronicle. And I wanted to continue this project after my internship ended. So I applied for a grant um, called the Eyewitness Grant, which is open for applications right now. It's funded through the Pulitzer Center and Diversify Photo. So that's something I would strongly, um, strongly recommend that everybody takes a look at and applies to. So after I met Sophia at this protest, I got her phone number and I called her about a week later. I told her that I was interested in documenting what pregnancy looked like during the pandemic. And immediately she was like, I'm down, let's do it. What do you, what do you need? And I thought that was just really incredible. And um, those are the people that you really wanna look for when you're pursuing these long-term projects is people who get it and understand what the goal is. And I think Sophia really understood that. Another thing I did while working on this project was I conducted a lot of research. Um, as I got to know Sophia a little bit more, I learned that she was dealing with housing insecurity, that she experienced homelessness during much of her life growing up in Bayview's Hunter, Hunters Point in San Francisco. Um, and she also was dealing with a lot of um, 
generational trauma from, from her family. So she was trying to overcome all of these barriers and challenges while also giving birth during a pandemic. And I tried to find research that could relate her experience to experience of other women of color in the community. These are some photos from Sophia's baby shower, which I think are really important and sort of carry the story along. Um, they show that as Pacific Islanders, um, the community exists, uh, they survive communally. They're always around a lot of people. And so I really wanted to show that part of Sophia's life. And although um, Sophia was dealing with housing insecurity, I uh, decided to document her and her partner on a vacation because I think that housing insecurity looks different for everybody. And I, I didn't want, um, want it to look the same as other projects or make her appear in a way that wasn't accurate. And so this was, this was her reality. And so I, I sort of stuck with that and, and looked for those moments. And with the help of the grant, I was able to spend a lot of time after my internship ended and just be there for moments like this. Um, this was when Sophia was in labor. Uh, she was in labor for nearly two days. And so it was sort of a balancing act for me to try to figure out um, when to photograph her and when to step away and just give space. And I think that's something you learn as a photographer over time is how to be in these intimate moments because Honestly, they can be very uncomfortable. Um, it's uncomfortable to see somebody in excruciating pain. So I tried to be really um, considerate of that. I was also looking out for small details that could show a little bit about who Sophia is. And I thought this was one of those moments where um, you know, Sophia had a photo of her and her father next to her during her labor. And it just shows um, how important family is to her and reinforcing that idea. The goal with this project was to photograph the birth inside of the hospital. Um, Sophia was completely okay with it, but with COVID and limitations in general, uh, I was unable to do that. So I found ways to work around that limited access by um, staying outside of the hospital and showing her coming out and embracing her mother, which I thought was a really sweet moment. So there's always a way um, to work around these limitations. And, you know, as journalists, we roll with a lot of punches, you know, we're working with people, we're working with the public and things change really often. So I've learned um, to be flexible when, and also patient when I'm um, in these situations. And these are some photos of uh, Sophia's daughter named Oshun. Uh, this is after she brought her home from the hospital. And this was sort of part of the end of the story. When I started, I tried to envision what the beginning of the story would look like, what the middle would look like, and then the end. Uh, the end was a little bit unexpected uh, because Sophia and her partner ended up splitting up and they decided to co-parent. And so I really wanted to get a photo of Sophia um, alone with her daughter and show them at the beach because this was a very spiritual and symbolic place for them. And so that's what I did. And this was a photo that closed out the story. And this is the final spread that ran in the Sunday edition of the San Francisco Chronicle. Lastly, I just want to share some work that I'm currently doing during my fellowship with the New York Times in Washington, DC. I think it's important to note that um, I did not get this fellowship uh, during the first try. I applied to the fellowship three times and each time I was rejected, I tried to reflect and think about how I can improve my portfolio. I tried to think about what I could do differently, um, what internships I could do that might bring my work to the next level. And so that's sort of the piece of advice I would give is, um, you know, start small and continue to work your way up because photojournalism really is, um, it's a marathon. Um, 
it, it takes time. And from each internship experience and each freelance experience, I've learned so much. And I finally felt like I was ready um, to take on uh, this big role. Another thing that really drew me um, to working in DC was seeing the first black woman and mixed race woman elected as vice president. Um, that's, it's really incredible to be in those spaces and be able to photograph her and photograph um, the president because there are not many um, women or black women doing this job. So I really uh, take great pride every day I'm able to go out and do this work. And the days are very long, especially on travel assignments. Um, we board Air Force One maybe two or three times and then board another plane three times after that. And so you're constantly running and hopping on and off planes. But I just tried to remember um, the position that I'm in and um, have gratitude every single day. And this is the last photo um, of my presentation. So I'd love to hear any questions um, that you all might have. Thank you. Wow, I mean, Sarah Bev, that is incredible. What a journey and you're still so young navigating this space. I mean, I just love your first off your honesty as like Sarah's um, because you, know, you didn't wake up, start with, with a New York Times fellowship, right? Um, you mentioned that you did this, you applied three times and rejected three times until you got it. So thank you for your honesty because we don't often talk about that. Um, now we are ready for the Q&A portion. Um, we have a lot of great questions in the Q&A box and some in the comment section as well. Um, well Shara, where to begin? <laughs> maybe cool. we can start uh, with um, Sarah or because I feel like uh, the first questions are towards you, Sarah. Um, let's see. I'm just gonna start from the top for Mario. Um, they ask, thank you for sharing your work, Sarah. The images are amazing. I have a question about your personal projects. How do you approach and communicate to the people slash communities about your vision for the work you like to convey and what was their response? Thank you for that question. Um, I think that's a super important question. Um, I think for me, um, when I work on uh, my personal projects, I know that it's uh, projects that oftentimes don't have like a time frame. So I can take my time in terms of um, approaching the communities, in terms of uh, spending time with them, and just kind of really understanding the story myself before, uh, before even starting to photograph it. So I would say, um, I think that's really an important piece of it is, is you know, do you do you you know do you know um, your collaborators? Do you know the story? Do you you know how much time have you spent with them? Um, and I think by the time that you kind of explain that, um, you know, it, it definitely makes it a lot easier. I think a lot of times, I think the challenge for me with photojournalism work is, you know, you you you're commissioned for a story and then you go for one day, you shoot what you shoot and then you leave. So I think that's why uh, for me it's so important to to work on the personal projects because I think of that time factor. It's just having the opportunity to spend time and to understand a little bit more. I hope that answers your question. That was um, perfect. Um, and I'm just gonna move quickly because we have so many great questions. Um, Mustafa says, beautiful work, Sarah. When do you think you, when do you think you are done with a project? When do you think you have done enough capturing the essence of the story? And how often do you multitask between pending stories you are working on? Um, and is something that is that something that happens with you? Um, I think that's that's a that's an, a good question. Um, I um, I haven't done many long term projects. Um, I you know and the ones the one that I'm working on now. I mean, like I said, I've been shooting it for five years. Um, but I, I don't, I mean, I don't know when, when it's going to end, um, you know, um, because it's about, you know, in, essentially about a child um, with a disability with no access to resources and kind of photographing that along the way, um, you know, so I, I don't know when it's going to end. Um, but, um, you know, for I think for the other projects um, that I do that aren't so long term, um, I don't know. I, I mean, I think 
I think that after a while or even time-wise, I think this, it just well, it gets to a point where, um, you know, you kind of get caught up with other assignments and then, um, you know, maybe uh, we'll, we'll just have less time to spend and then you kind of, um, you know, get to the point where you just kind of need to wrap it up or whatever. So I think, I think, um, I think it depends on the assignment. It depends on the story. Um, you know, sometimes stories also just kind of come to, you know, come to their end. Definitely. Um, and this, you know, question is for both of you, whoever would like to take it first. Um, with long-term photo projects, um, how do you support yourself financially? Uh, this person wants to start a long-term project, but they are uncertain of how to make money while working on the projects. I would say it's it requires a lot of um, time management. While I started a personal project, I was in school and working part-time. Um, so I really relied on the money I was making part-time. And then I would spend time reaching out to subjects and going out in the field when I was off of work. So that would usually be on the weekends. I would sacrifice a lot of weekends um, to spend time researching and going out and finding these people. Um, so I think it all just comes down to uh, the time management, which, which can be tricky, but it's not impossible. And I guess just to go along with that is also kind of the stories that you um, that you choose, right? Because as Sarah Beth is saying, you know, time is going to be a huge factor, especially because of an, on a personal project, nobody's really paying you to do the work. So I would say location. So maybe pick stories that are close by, you know, as close as possible, so that you can, you know, um, you can one spend more time because you know it's it's proximity wise. But also that um, that you know that you don't have to now start thinking about traveling and costs and those types of things. So I think uh, if you're going to work on a long-term project, I would say that part of the consideration for that is how uh, how you know quickly you know how close is this uh, story to where I am and how often will I be able to access it. So I, I mean I think that's a huge consideration when you're looking at a long-term project is just how how you know access wise whether it's financial or whether it's distance or whatever um, um, how you know how easily you'll have access to it and also um, you know if you're working with you know and of course what happens with long-term projects is you know you become friends obviously with the person and, and that type of thing but obviously if you do a long-term project maybe with family or you know someone who's already a friend then you know even access is much easier you know so that you know as you keep working on something it's um, you know that they're, that they're okay with it or that you already have a, lot, a relationship. So I think there are considerations, but I think that's also um, a good one to think about. Definitely. Um, thank you both for those answers. Um, and this can be both for both, um, but why don't we start with you, Sarah, because uh, as folks have mentioned in the chat, you have range with your stories and the photos that you tell and the projects that you pursue. How do you um, take that range and display it on your site without looking too scattered, without you know, making, it, making it feel cohesive? How do you communicate that to the people you, you, know, you wanna get hired by? Um, do you recommend having separate portfolio, portfolios for each thing or how do you present your work when you have that diverse range? So I think, I mean, I think that there are a number of issues that kind of go along with that, right? So being a self-taught photographer means you can experiment a lot. Like, I don't think that you're in a, you're, you know, in necessarily in the boxes, you know, I assume that you would be uh, if you, you know, if you kind of went to study a certain thing. So I think that that kind of comes with that aspect of it is because I feel that I'm constantly experimenting and will probably continue to do so. Uh, but I think that it also fits my personality because I like, um, I like to, I like to, I love to learn, you know, I love to experience new things. I like to try new things. And so I think it works well for me. Um, but, you know, I, like I said, I, I, you know, my background is in sociology and psychology. And so people and people's stories and social issues is always kind of at the background of, of the work that I'm interested in doing. And so um, it might be different things. It might be different stories. The approach might be different, but at the heart of it, you know, is my interest in those social situations and trying to find kind of creative ways to, um, to show that work. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I take a continent perspective to this as well. 
if you, you know, you live here and work here, um, uh, you know, I think photography work has just kind of, you know, started becoming much more monetary in the last few years. So you kind of did have to just be able to do a lot of things because you had to survive, you know what I mean? So um, I think that that's kind of, uh, that kind of contributes to that. Um, but I think that my passion is always there. I always have my personal projects that I want to work on. Um, but then, you know, I think that the people, the clients, the people who reach out to me to work on things, um, you know, kind of understand my interests and the underlying themes and, and, and also my strengths. Um, and so I don't think it, like I said, I don't post everything everywhere, you know? Um, I think um, even here, the idea was to show you that, um, you know, um, even in having the ability to navigate different kind of um, uh, genres, um, a lot of my interests are the same, you know? Um, and, um, and yeah, um, I, I, hope, I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. Um, Sarah Beth, did you have anything to add to that? It's okay if you don't. Just no, that was great. <laughs> um, great. <I'll> <laughs> um, question for you both. Um, and one thing I, that I really love about this discussion we've been having, both of you guys sharing your journey is that again, we're trying to stress that you both started from the beginning. You did not wake up photographing the president of the United States and you did not wake up, you know, having international exhibitions and major campaign projects and et cetera. Um, and so these two folks ask, you know, how did you even you know, find your voice? Like, and then when it comes to, you know, all the different things that you're photographing, assignments, whether it's personal project or commissioned, how do you balance it all? How do you, you know, if you have a creative block, what do you do to overcome that? Um, and do you have any advice for it when things become too overwhelming? I know there was like three different questions. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I think in the beginning, it's easy to get wrapped up in work that other people are doing and compare yourself to people and, um, I definitely felt that like my first couple years of college and um, I felt like my voice wasn't important, but that wasn't the truth. It was just that there were people that couldn't relate to it. Um, and my work and my vision was different than um, the people in my classes. And once I accepted that and, and learned um, the things that I care about, um, it really offered a lot of clarity. And like I said, I took a semester off of school and I traveled to New York for the first time. I went to Photoville, um, which is a photo exhibit in New York. And that was really what changed things for me was um, getting inspiration from other people and like finding that community. And I also found a lot of people that could vouch for me and that recommended me for things. Um, so I think that having that community is really the part that's extremely helpful, like Sarah was saying. Um, and I completely forgot the second and third question that was attached to that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I know I threw a lot at you all. Um, so thank you for answering that first part. Um, I guess speaking to when you have a creative block um, and when things are you know, overwhelming, how do you balance that? Any advice for that? I try to do things that are unrelated to journalism. I do boxing like every other week. I do yoga. Um, I try to stay active and like spend time with friends. And I think that's helpful to just sort of reset my brain um, and not be thinking about journalism 24 seven, which is very hard not to do. Um, and in terms of finding inspiration, I think that lately I've been finding a ton of inspiration by just talking to people in the communities that I'm working in. Every time I talk to somebody, they tell me about a new story or something going on or a person they know. And that always sparks like a new idea. Um, for example, um, I just pitched and photographed a story for the Times about a statue of a United States colored troop soldier that was erected in downtown Franklin, Tennessee. And I found out about that story because some people I was photographing the month before told me that was happening. And so it's really just a matter of exploring outside of the four walls of your room and talking to people in in the community I think that's what what has kept me inspired beautiful answer and um, for you Sarah yeah I got to kind of I mean I think Sarah Beth has really mentioned a lot of things um but I think I think for me um it definitely has to do with um you know with with kind of 
uh, working on, 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 on different things as well. So, um, you know, sometimes I'll have an, I mean, I just came off an assignment that was looking at childbirth and, um, and, you know, when, when Sarah Beth was showing her story, I just kind of got flashbacks of being in the room and like, you know, seeing that whole process. Um, and, you know, of course that got me, and I mean, that was an assignment, but it got me thinking about all types of other things. Um, and, and it really is important that I think that, um, um, and I think that Yagazian mentioned this in, in one of her talks, which you should all watch the other talks, by the way. Um, I think that they're also helpful. But um, she mentioned how when you go on assignment to photograph one thing that, you know, that you learn about so many other things, especially because a lot of the, um, you know, like the, the, the I think, the, I think the, the, the greatest thing about, you know, um, you know, photojournalism with this photography work is going to places that you would never otherwise go. And so I think being out there itself is kind of inspiration so you kind of work on the story but then you're you know you're kind of listening to all these other stories and seeing all these new places and um and just kind of learning you know learning and unlearning i'd say um so i think um you know if you are still early on and maybe aren't getting enough um, um assignments um, in order to kind of experience that um you know um yeah i think uh i think community is huge i think you know conversations um um you know reading um you know I, I think the news is terrifying but i think sometimes there are interesting stories in there you know so i think you just have to to find what works for you um and um and yeah and you know hopefully something will come along thank you both i'm going to turn it to my share to ask the next few questions uh, sure thing uh both of you mentioned about uh building uh, or being a part of communities. Uh, so one of our attendees asks, how did you go about opening up and networking with other collectives and uh, getting other opportunities? I think I started um, connecting with other communities and um, different photographers before the pandemic, which was, um, an advantage because I was able to like go to events in person. I know that's sort of hard to do these days. Um, but when things do start um, getting more back to normal, I would definitely recommend like um, assisting different photographers and learning from them. That was something that I did often, um, as well as um, going to different attending different panels and discussions, um, you know, things like this, where you're able to um, meet people. And I would definitely say like, always reach out and stay in contact with people. That's something that I try to do often is stay in contact with the people who have really helped me um, and find the people that are in my corner. Because of course there's gonna be people that aren't supportive or, you know, um, it's, it's good to find the people that have your back. And I think that's the most important thing is to focus on who those people are. Um, and you can do that even just by like connecting with people on social media or, you know, going to portfolio reviews. That has also been a huge help is attending free portfolio reviews. That's giving me a lot of exposure um, to different photo editors and people in the industry. So um, I definitely try to take advantage of all the events that are happening with Black women photographers, Diversify Photo, um, Authority Collective, and um, all the other ones. There are so many resources out there. So definitely tap into those things. And uh, to you, Sarah, uh, we have the same question, but uh, uh, one, uh, one of uh, the attendees asks, so you were, you were a part of One Touch? If yes, how is that for you? That must be a Kenyan, yes. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll just kind of answer before. So I think, um, I, I mean, I talk about social media a lot just because like, I really feel like in terms of being a creator from the continent that it really kind of helped us uh, to, uh, to, to get out there, right? Um, I think there was just so much gatekeeping before that we didn't have access. So in terms of building community, I think um, initially for me, social media was, was one of those big things. You know, I think I, you know, I, just through, through Instagram, for, for instance, I, I met so many photographers from all over the world. Um, sometimes I'll be in a city and, and you know, and have, will have kind of communicated with someone for so long and, you know, we've never met, but feel like we've met because we kind of built these relationships um, 
um, through social media. So I think that that was happening, you know, even like uh, way before uh, the pandemic. Um, but I think that through Instagram, I was able to meet like, you know, even local photographers, um, um, you know, the one touch that, that someone has mentioned, um, you know, um, I met members of that through, um, you know, um, through Instagram and it was a great opportunity. I feel I got to get out there and, and photograph and, um, you know, and work with other people or work alongside other people. So I think that that was great, but I have to agree that, you know, um, there's so many communities now, um, you know, that are, are allowing, I think, all of us to just, you know, reach out to each other, ask questions about rates and uh, licensing and um, all types of things. Um, and I think that that just wasn't, you know, um, there before. So I think building and, uh, and joining a community now is, I think, so much more so much easier. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that it's it's very worthwhile to, to become a part of those. But, you know, I mentioned earlier in my talk that I, I think you just need to apply for stuff, you know, whether it's a portfolio review, you know, um, you know, I, I, a lot of times uh, there'll be editors at portfolio reviews, there'll be fe uh, people who run festivals at por portfolio reviews, um, just meeting someone, having those conversations, um, other photographers, whether it's workshops or um, 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 applying for grants, applying for competitions, of course, you know um, if if they're they're free, I usually encourage applying for the free ones. But anyway, um, yeah, I think all those things kind of set you up to to open yourself up to as many kind of different possibilities as possible. And I think the biggest thing to remember is it's not about winning a competition. It's not about getting a grant. It's not about uh, you know, if you go into it thinking like, you know, because I mean, it takes a long time to write a grant proposal, like a really long time. And so if you don't get it, I know that it's easy to be like, oh, I'm never going to do that again, because it just took so long. And I'm so disappointed. But the reality is that you never know what could happen. First of all, it's, it's this practice for the next one, or someone else could read it and be like, hey, I like this, it didn't work for that. But I think you should do this. I mean, there's so many opportunities. So I, I think that when you go into all these things that the end goal is not, um, is not, you know, like, yes, I'm going to win. Yes, I'm going to do this or that. It's really just, I'm putting myself out there for what essentially was meant for me. And I think that it will come. Oh, thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, one more question before we close. Uh, this is in relation to what both of you uh, mentioned about your portfolios. So um, how do you make a good portfolio? Can I share photos on my website and social media that haven't been published yet? I mean, is it safe? Um, to answer that question, uh, for me, I usually try to be careful when uh, posting photos if they haven't been published yet, um, because oftentimes if you're pitching or publishing a story with a publication, they want um, they want to publish it first. They don't want to see it on your social media first. Um, so that's something to definitely keep in mind is if your goal is to get it published somewhere, um, I would say hold off on sharing it on your personal pages. But if it's just something that you enjoy and it's a single image and um, you want to share it, uh, you totally should. Um, so yeah, that's my piece of advice. Um, yeah, I, I would, I, oops, sorry. No, go ahead. Sorry, Sarah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I would definitely um, agree with Sarah Beth that, you know, if it's something that you're trying to pitch or want to pitch, um, that you probably should hold off on, on publishing it. But sometimes you create something and you're so excited about it and you want to share it. So you just have to find, I think, a balance. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I know that, you know, sometimes for, you know, when you're just starting out, you know, you, you're just trying to get your name out there. So I think when you're, when you're early on, you really do need to just share, you know, share your work. You, mean, you, don't, you might not need to share like the whole, you know, every single image from the series, but maybe just a couple, you know, just to show, um, just to show kind of what you're capable of doing. Um, I, I think, um, I, I think, I think it's, it's, it's also important to, to I guess it's, it's, it's important to find a, a balance. Um, as far as a website versus Instagram, um, I, I think, I think you, you absolutely have to have a website. And I, and I think that because on a website you can post like 
like whole stories. So if you're looking to, you know, to share a portfolio with, I don't know, an editor, it might be important for them to see that you know how to build a story. And so the thing with Instagram is when you're just posting one photo here and there, it, it, it might show that you, you know, you have the technical skills, but not, you know, maybe per se having the skills to, um, you know, to create and put together a whole story. So I think that, I think both are great, but um, I think that, I think it's equally important to have a, to still have a website or even and still create a portfolio that you can share if, if someone asks for it. Thank you both for your answers. And I know there's so many other great questions in the Q&A box that we can't get to, um, but because of time, and I know Sarah Bev, you have to run soon for uh, to be on assignment. Lastly, um, what are, are in your guys' go-to bags um, for your camera, your battery life, all the things? Uh, do you have anything that you go to uh, for photographers to maybe look into? So when I'm traveling, I usually have a whole um, suitcase with me full of equipment. I have two camera bodies I always use. Um, it's always great to have like, um, um, a zoom lens like a 24 to 70 and then I also usually have a longer lens like a 70 to 200 with me um, just in case so those are like my two go-to things and then um, sometimes I carry a couple prime lenses um, and I try to like experiment with those whenever I can so um, that's my go-to and I definitely make sure to have extra batteries all the time and have everything charged all the time um, because I shoot on um, Sony. I have two Sony A1s and um, the batteries are not the longest lasting. So that's something that I have to stay on top of all the time. But I would definitely recommend um, any type of Sony camera. It's the camera that I started with was a DSLR Sony. And so I've kind of stuck with that brand. Um, so yeah. Um, I mean, I guess it depends, you know, what, what you're shooting or what type of ass assignment you're on. I mean, I think I always have a 50, um, a, a 50 lens on me. Um, um, and, you know, it pretty much works in, in most situations. Um, but of course, a 24-7 is great too. Um, but something that's not uh, photography related that's always in my bag is my uh, travel uh, coffee press. <laughs> mug and I say that because I feel like even if I'm on assignment anywhere and I can still have a good cup of coffee that my day and the assignment will go great so I think you also need your comfort things um and that is mine so yeah I love that so much <laughs> Um, thank you both immensely for such an insightful conversation, for your transparency from the rejections to just the motivation um, for the photographers and everyone else who attended this session. Um, please do connect with our panelists after the fact. I know a lot of you had other questions. Reach out to them. Uh, they are very busy, so they will get back to you when they can. Um, and Sarah Beth mentioned, mentioned that she's currently a New York Times fellow. Applications are open for that fellowship. It is limited to US-based applicants, unfortunately. Um, so if you are based in the US, go check that out. The link was dropped in the chat, but you can also just go to the New York Times site and apply there. And as mentioned, both of them are grantees. So you can apply for the grant that is currently open with the Pulitzer Center and Diversify Photo. So do go check that out. We dropped that in the chat as well. And we will share these resources outside um, on social media. Uh, with Shara, anything from you? Uh, don't forget Black women photographers have grants on grants on grants. Um, apply, <laughs> that's all. Uh, that's one of the tips we have uh, uh, received today. So apply and take your chance. You never know. Also tune yes. into our podcast, Repicture, a new episode dropped today. I really want to give you all the tea, but please go and listen on your own. You'll, you'll have a good time. So thank you so much for tuning into this class of The Essentials.
And please do go back and rewind some of these sessions. We talked a lot about grants and applying and shooting your shot. Well, guess what? We've already had sessions that just discussed that, that gave you best advice, best practical tips of applying, um, you know, for, you know, residencies and grants and things like that. So go replay the conversations and RSVP for the next class that's next week. Um, and we hope you all have a great night, morning, afternoon, wherever you are at. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.